Hello everyone, my name is Louis Rueda. I'm a registered respiratory therapist and this is Lung Lab. We're going to be discussing the IPV2C. So we can spend a little time talking about the features, functionality, and basic uh, introduction and the fundamentals of how it operates. Come join me. To begin, if you're not familiar with this device, it is called IPV or intrapulmonary percussive ventilation. It is categorized as a mode of ventilation. It's actually known by in textbooks as well as in literature as high frequency percussive ventilation. What you'll notice is pretty standard with a lot of their devices. They color code where the connection for the circuit is going to go. You have your operational pressure here, which is the power source. When we connect this, this box requires a 50 PSI source. So it is a pneumatic ventilator. And this is the actually going to control the operational pressure here that we're going to have set at 40 PSI. I've talked to many doctors and even therapists and they tend to believe that this is actually the pressure that's being applied on the patient. It is not. It's actually PSI, pounds per square inch. It is what's being converted for this machine to work from your 50 PSI source, and this is regulating it. How you find out the pressure being applied on the patient is going to be on the side of the machine. This is the device that is connected in. It is one of the newer models that Percussion Air calls the multimeter. So in the past, their devices had a manometer and you would be able to see a swinging pendulum of the needle in order to find out what pressure you're giving. And it would show you basically the peak pressure what being applied on the patient. Now, the difference between a peak pressure on IPV and the peak pressure on conventional ventilation is these are mini bursts of air that are piling on top of each other in order to recruit and ventilate the patient. So the difference is on the manometers you would see pressures of, you know, up to 40 or 50. And again, many doctors, even RTs would think that that is the full pressure being applied on the patient, that you're gonna cause barotrauma, you're gonna cause uh, possible pneumos. So it's one of those things that we like to highlight that with this device, because it's happening within milliseconds, you don't get the large volume behind the pressure, which is actually what damages the lungs. It's not the fact that it's just a high pressure, but it's really the volume that's followed behind the pressure that causes over distension and can damage lung tissue. So it's worth keeping in mind and once connected to the ports for your circuit and a 50 PSI source, you will start to see right here on the right side your percussive rate or frequency. And right around here in sort of the middle, you will see a big number reflecting the map. So now the company really, you know, is trying to emphasize the fact that yes, there is a higher peak pressure, but it's happening in a split second. So keep in mind that actually the map that you're applying on the patient, which you can use a little more universally between different types of ventilation, is consistently lower. Uh, study after study shows that that the map when using you know high frequency percussive ventilation is always lower than an oscillator. Lower, tends to be lower than a jet ventilator. And also 
much lower. Sometimes even as much as half of that of conventional ventilation. So that comes more into play when you're dealing with a continuous ventilator, like the Bronchotron or VDR4, which are continuous ventilators. This instead, even though it is classified as a ventilator, is meant as a therapeutic device. As you can see, um, you wouldn't keep a patient on this continuously for some of the main facts that you don't have enough alarms on here to make this a optimal device to use in that circumstance. And really, you know, th those things would be like a disconnection alarm. You know, if you walked away and they disconnected from the circuit, there's no way of knowing that. Um, the alarms it does have in place are a peak pressure alarm, which if it hits 50 PSI on the back end, there is an internal alarm that you'll actually hear and it'll just kind of honk at you and create a, uh, a loud noise. So it's very small in diameter. Uh, I would like to probably say it's about, let's see, this is my phone case slash a wallet case. And it's exactly that. So probably about mm, seven inches, six, seven, eight, seven inches or so. Um, so very compact. Now, continuing with the parameters that we have in these knobs. First thing you'll notice is that there are a couple of them have different colors. The next thing is that they're given letters. These are just ways to differentiate. Uh, I tend not to call them by their letter because it seems to be a little easier to kind of get mixed up, especially when you're talking to people that are seeing it for the first time. It's much easier just to call it by what it is. So demand CPAP is your yellow button. Inspiratory time is black and as A. Uh, inspiratory flow is a green knob, also knob C. And your frequency is a black knob, also knob B. You have your master switch here to the bottom right. You have your nebulizer switch, which is always turned on. Whenever you're giving a treatment, you want to have your nebulizer running to provide sufficient humidification and aerosol. Uh, we talked about the operational pressure on the 2C. I always have it set to 40. I'll explain that shortly. And then you have your color-coded connectors for your circuit. Red is for gauge or pressure gauge. The white is for phase or phasotron, which connects it to the back of the circuit and creates the percussions. You have your green for the remote, not used entirely too often, but uh, they still have them available and there are a few circuits out there that uh, still have that feature for the patient to have control over when the percussions are stronger. Uh, and then you have your yellow line for the nebulization. You have your manual inspiration button, basically a push button. Uh, I tend not to use this button and you basically, you can create a manual breath with this, but there's no limitation on it. So if you're holding it for too long, it's possible you cause some barotrauma. You know, it does take a skilled therapist to know um, based off the patient and the history and all those things. So it's not something I really go to in the beginning. Um, some people tend to want to use this. I tend to kind of stay away. I can effectively recruit by utilizing my inspiratory flow and my frequency much better than just giving them a rush of flow. So that's a preference of mine. Again, just speaking from my own ex experience and, you know. So thank you for watching Lung Lab, your host, Louis Rueda. And this is part one of our new series.